like that's sort of an Eau Claire, sort of a Bermuda Triangle thing with Eau Claire, because one time we, I think we're coming back from Milwaukee, and somebody, the keys accidentally got locked in the rental car, so we lost an hour. Hey, what's the date of the Bastille Day show? 17th. So we're still July. So July we're finish 17th. Up three songs and record five still. That was easy. Four days. Five days. Well, the whole plan was to narrow it down because we logically we're not going to narrow it down. So there's no. I'm not going to bring my attitude to it. We're just being realistically not pessimistic. Right. But we can do it. I mean, if you want to, if you can get these four songs recorded and all the overdubs done, then if we have time, Uh, well, yeah, well, I think, uh, but I think Rich to me, I'd rather hear my own time if I was in Rich to me. But I, I mean, I also like Rich to me. Rich to me is <laughs> for for uh, failure. Just <laughs> it's a frantic dog. Pretty well behaved normally it seems. Yeah. 
love to see if you have food. Oh yeah, I found that out the hard way. Should I draw some of those up and bring them over to Jules? Yeah, I Excited to be associated with Love Carp, Mark Spencer. He's a very good songwriter, and uh, so we we had a great show. People danced, and I felt that was the first time I ever kind of felt like the people in the audience were having as much fun as I was, sort of. Yeah. yeah. And and, uh, and then my friend inherited. Uh, a huge chunk of money and flew like me and 20 other people down to Jamaica the next and that was the next day so I had this show this like show where I saw like how good it can feel you know to to really connect with an audience and then to go to Jamaica and do nothing except party and smoke weed and Iceland air And, and it was just crazy, it was beautiful to really reflect, you know. That had to, been, had to have been a great week. Yeah, it was. You know, the sequence of those things. I was a little nervous because I flew to, to Montego Bay and then got on a, like a puddle jumper to Negril, which was reeked of gasoline. You could see sharks in the water below and it was a bumpy ride. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then I got dropped off in the grill, and their airport was basically like, it kind of looked like a bus stop. And there I was, and I didn't know, I didn't know where I was staying. I didn't know, you know what I mean? These, my friend bought me these tickets, gave me two flight number, flight numbers, and just said somebody will be there. And then I get there, and there's nobody. There. But uh, I, one of the nights we were there, there were a couple of kids from Austria traveling, and um, so I, they didn't speak very good English. So 
they learned that I speak, speak German, so we talked a lot. And, and then one of the really wild night, a lot of a lot of crazy stuff happened. Anyway, so I'm out of my mind, hallucinating. And these two Austrian guys knock on the door, and they say, <coughs> "Hey, Mati, we sind beraubt worden," which of course means we've been robbed. So they want me to go down. They basically woke up. They were like 20 feet away from us. They woke up. Both had pis pistols in their mouths. They got they got like $800 cash ripped off. So they're like, like I said, I'm. I'm hallucinating, and uh, they're like, will you come down to the police station and translate for us? <laughs> so I, we get a cab, we go to the police station, and it was probably like 100 degrees in the police station. And there, it was like, I don't know if it was the town drunk or prostitute or whatever, but there was a, it was like, kind of was like the Andy Griffith type setup where, <laughs> Oh, here we are, and then here's a cage, and this woman is in this cage, beating the padlock, a large padlock, against the cage for the entirety of the uh, visit, and screaming. And I'm, like I said, <laughs> you know, when you're hallucinating, these, type, these types of things get a little amplified, I guess you'd say. And I can't under I can understand the German guys better than I can understand the chief of police or who, whatever. Um, it was. Oh man. But the moral of the story is. That's when I sort of decided like, music was a good thing, you know. <laughs> then I got back from Jamaica, and we were um, working on a record with Mike Wisty, actually. Mm -hmm. And Kim Randall was gonna put it out, but she had, uh, um, no alternative records, and um, she, she gave us a contract to sign, and uh, Hold off until the jet passes. Uh, she, she gave us a, a contract to sign, it was a five record deal, which uh, I thought was cool, and then I gave it to a lawyer, and he's like, you'd be a fucking idiot to sign a five record deal. That's, they'll own your, she owns you for your career. And uh, Lifter Puller did the same thing, but they, I think they just did one record with her and then told her to fuck off. Uh -oh. um, and that was part of the Twin Town, or the Twin Tone, which like put out the early replacement shit, so. I was excited about that, but so one day I went to, uh, we're sitting on this contract for like two months and she's trying to get the ball rolling, so Grinder, the drummer, and I met her for coffee, and uh, so the bassist calls and he's like, hey, what'd you do today? And I said, oh, we, uh, Grinder and I had coffee with no alternative records, and um, He quit the band <laughs> because of that. He's like, you're, you're having fucking business meetings without me. This is my oh. brother-in-law, yeah, so. Wait, Grinder's your brother-in-law? No, oh. Pavlich, the bassist. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. I think that's a DC-10, maybe DC-9. So then I didn't have a bassist, I had a drummer, and that's when uh, Lisa Briones, I met her, and she came on and played keyboards, and uh, we eventually changed her name to the Spring Collection, and then Lisa got her friend Cindy to play bass, and then Lisa quit because she and Cindy didn't get along very well, as it mm -hmm. turned out. Decided to move on without her, but then Pavlich came back, okay. and Dax joined. Oh. 
Okay. Because Lisa quit. He called me and he said, I heard your keyboardist quit. John Shry and Pavlich and Grinder went off and did Divorce with Ryan Seitz oh. after I announced that my name was Fogene and that I was going solo. And they thought I was crazy. Hey, this is Maddie from Fogene. Uh, Jim Weber said I should call you about the show on Sunday. Um, like with, to get loading times and all that. It's uh, okay. It's good to feel like there's a, uh, you know. Oh, the warehouse. You there, there. There's a light way down there somewhere oh, cool. that we're kind of closing in. Like, yeah. You know. So really close here oh, to the yeah, end, okay. like, uh, what well, you guys did, how many tracks uh, okay. a ways back? You know, last year you did? Oh, we did like six last year, and, and I was it's looking at the drum. the uh, the tape, like uh, the tape reel, and it was dated in June of last year, and that's, so I guess that's kind of when that started. Yeah. And, uh, and it's like, wow, you're going to slow by before you even really know it at all, you know, it's just like, okay, I remember sitting out here last summer doing the same thing, and and being back here again, it's it's good to be. It's very very good to be like uh, getting close to having something finished. Yeah. <laughs> Technically, we put out something into every year. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you think about? I thought um, album title, Nature of Mort, which is the French for still life, so it plays on nature and dead lover. Corinne said, was saying, I said, dance, 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 and she said, what about dance, question mark, dance, period, dance, exclamation. <laughs> dance, dance, Good. dance.
Hey, Dex, how are the phones? I'm sorry? <laughs> That's just everything. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. That's, cool. That's, that's cool. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try the phones. Let's roll it. Okay, tape's going. Say like 30 seconds, 20 seconds, so that I know exactly when I can cue the band. Okay? Hi. You're listening to FM Week on Radio K. Hey. What did we just hear? We heard Be Your Own Pet with the song Spill, and before that we heard X-Ray Specs, Oh Bondage Up Yours. Indeed. Yes. Here comes Fo Jean on Radio K. Thanks for listening. FM Week. Go. This is the part where I lounge. Uh. <laughs> Oh, it sounded like awesome. Like practice space awesome? Bo Jean are playing at the Uptown Bar on Saturday the 25th. Other than that, we, the song we picked out to play is by the Rank Strangers. The song is called My Genius. And we're in the studio with the author of that song, who is a genius, uh, Mike Whiskey, who's producing our material. And, uh, we go in and he uh, insults us for about eight hours at a stretch and then, and then we leave by John Dax. That is correct. It's a musician's life. Yes. All right, before we get to that, I want to let you know that Radio K wants to give you a CD pack featuring the Olympic hopefuls Sandra Lerke and AC Newman. Now, the Rick Strangers on FM Week on Radio K. That's how they kiss. We can't find the rest Good to meet you. Who's tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow is Men and Evils. And then Wednesday's Atmosphere. Uh, Wednesday's Building Better Bombs. Wednesday's Thursday's Atmosphere. Cool. Well, it was nice to see everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, got it. 
Oh, when you guys are loading out, I can remember. <laughs> yes. Yeah, did you see that announcement? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he just left. <laughs> well, I didn't. I mean, no, I'm just uh, I fancy myself an engineer, but I'm not much of a musician, so. There were wrong notes, but they sound great. That's all that matters. From audio perspective. <laughs> Put that in your docudrama. So, Corinne is, uh, uh, I love singing with her. I really, um, the, when I was looking for a singer, I, I, I used to hang out at this coffee shop where she worked, and all of her coworkers were always like, Corinne is the best singer you've got to hear. And I couldn't, I thought her last name was Colette, which is incorrect. I tried finding her in the phone book and all that. Finally tracked her down at First Avenue and she was singing, uh, uh, I think she sang Gloomy Sunday or something. She walked down the stairs. She's like, I got it. That's it. She has to be, I have to sing with her. And um, just technically, she's such a, a better singer than I am that she forces me <laughs> to have to sing well, and uh, I like that. And she's good energy, she's, uh, you know, I love her. Why do all your alibis seem like silly lies? I don't know, I'm just supposed She's good in a lot of ways. She has good ideas. Uh, her sense of just her pitch, her, her feel for harmonies, her feel for all that stuff. Just it, 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 it makes me excited about like when I'm working on a song, like new songs, knowing how good it can sound. Uh, knowing that she's going to sing it, and that's a good feeling. Um, also, I mean, like, uh, outside of the band, she and I occasionally will play at, uh, you know, a restaurant or, a, oh. like, a pool party. We played at a pool party, <laughs> and, it's like, she and I were standing next to this pool full of people, uh, steam coming off the pool, and we're <laughs> singing, you know, Four Seasons and stuff. We could, whereas a lot of people would be like, I don't want to take up a Thursday. Thursday night or a fr Friday night to go off and do some goofy gig. She is, you know, she's gung ho and, um, you know, she wants to, she, she, you know, she wants to be performing as much as possible. What about Mike? Tell me about Mike. Lopez is, uh, he's a great musician. He is, uh, uh, he's actually, you know, very well versed. He's, it, 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 it's, he's sort of opened my eyes up in a lot of ways, like um, be working on a song and he'll be like, no, it, sh it has to be eighth notes and because the, the kick drum falls here. He thinks, he started out as a drummer um, up in Grand Forks, North mm -hmm. Dakota. And uh, so he really thinks in a very complete way about music, whereas mm -hmm. I have a a, a little more of sort of a vague autistic approach. <laughs> He's more concrete, so it's mm. a good it's a good meeting, you know. Mm. Um, he's uh, he's very passionate, um, uh, excited, you know, or excitable, I should say, you know, uh, about you know, music, about art. Um, he's a student. Still, he's at the University of Minnesota, and so it's it's interesting since I've been out of school for a long time to think of think of somebody sort of going through that and also putting as much time as they do in the faux gene. So mm -hmm. it's it's his like level of dedication is is uh, I'm I'm flattered, you know, that he puts the time that he does in because he seems really pissed off at the other half. <laughs> yeah, no, Lo Lopez is good people. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, like when I, uh, we went out of town, you know, I lived in the same apartment for 12 years. We went out of town, we did a show, and we we're driving back into town after a grueling weekend. He's like, hey, can anybody help me move? And uh, he's like, yeah, I'll help you. And um, I don't think he realized it, what he was getting into, but, <laughs> but he saved my life. He saved my ass. He'll do that, you know. He really, you know, he has a strong sense of what people do for each other. Cool. So. That's cool. Okay, uh, what about Scott, new drummer? Uh, Scott is, um, Scott is very, like, dedicated to his instrument, and, uh, uh, like, more than I'm dedicated to guitar, you know, uh, which is, which is great, like, Grinder, our old drummer, would, like a kid who's sort of like, I think I might be able to play drums, I'm going to buy a kit. And, hey, I can. And, <laughs> you know, winds up being virtuoso. But, uh, Scott works out, you know, he's taken lessons, he's, um, he plays jazz. It was kind of funny because Corinne, mm -hmm. when I first saw her sing, mm -hmm. Scott was playing drums. Oh, so you saw two future yeah, members I, at the same yeah, time. Yeah, and I saw Scott and I was just... You know, all he had was a, a snare and a kick, and people were just sort of jamming and stuff. And uh, and I saw just like a real natural um, feel for the instrument, you know, where... And I had seen him play with Efflores, Mondo Film, and, you know, other bands, uh, Flim Flam Man. So I knew he had the ability to rock as well, so... Um, and, he's, and he's a good dude. Yeah, you know, he he uh, drives a pickup truck <laughs> with a topper. Um, and uh, finally, what about uh, what about Steve? Rock and Gene Bakken. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, I, he's a, a a gentle soul. <laughs> he's a very gentle soul. And um, that's where I'll insert the clip from last night for you. With your <laughs> arm around his shoulder. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. It's okay. He, he's, he is hard on himself, and, uh, you know, when he, we, you know, we've been without a lead guitarist for, I don't know, eight months, maybe longer, and, uh, and I s sort of thought to myself, I don't, I don't, I want another guitarist, but I, I, I only want somebody who is sort of, really feels music, you know, um, uh, and uh, Lopez was like, hey, my buddy is moving down here from Grand Forks. Can uh, he crash out with us for a couple of weeks, you know? <laughs> and uh, he just broke up with his girlfriend. And uh, he wants to come down here and kind of get his stuff going. And we'd been over the winter while Dax and Lopez and I sat over here making demos and writing songs. Um, we would listen to Steve's CDs. I don't cool. know if you've heard any of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, and uh, and it was so I had a pretty good idea of who this guy was. Um, we actually we went up to Grand Forks, Fargo, and played with him mm. over the winter. It was 35 below the entire weekend. So he, you know, yeah, he can come crash out for a couple of weeks, <laughs> try to find a job, you know, see what happens. And we were just sitting around here. I was playing guitar, and he picked up a guitar and. And uh, because when I'd seen him play live, you know, he played keyboards, he did a little guitar. I didn't realize how, that he was a, like a shit hot guitarist. Yeah. And, uh, unnatural, you know, and I was like, well, you live here, you might as well be in this band. You know? <laughs> and like that first night that you came over and filmed us was like the first night that we had all just played together. <laughs> Yeah, there was. Oh no. Was there a change that wasn't recorded?
according to plan. Maybe there was just a little... Because it might have been cooler. Oh, uh, it was right in the, the nebulous zone between planned and unplanned that something... It was just a little... The, the, I and I heard an open really string, but that, but that was, was... It kind of reminded me of Chuck Berry. Open string? Because hmm. Chuck Berry always plays open string. But... How did you think the uh, recording went today? It went really well. It was really good. Uh, yeah, I think... I think it's better when we do vocals. I think the eight, Just him I and I without other people is, around because we get be, stuff done fast, you know? Right, right. It's cool. Hold on a second, going by a bus stop right now. It's it went really well. well that seemed like what a good it? setup because uh, are those... Uh, uh, never really like yeah. sung together before. Oh, those are my sunglasses. Okay, cool. Oh, oh these are great on you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, well, my sunglasses no, are going to so I... We uh, 30, usually track separately, oh, and we so track together for right. a couple songs today, and it went really Just well. So. That you could probably cue off the other person, and uh... yeah, and like we've okay. sung a lot of these live, mm. which some of them in the past we have not. We, oh, like, okay. we I kind of learned in the studio, so it's okay. different than when we've already rehearsed them. A lot of you know what I mean. It's easier to sing together that yeah. way. Yeah. Yesterday, I, Mark Lacroix was on the air. Yeah, yeah. And I called him to say, Lacroix. 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 <laughs> I called to say thank you for doing a good job of mixing and requested an Elizabeth Cotton song. And then, oh, yeah. uh, and, he, and he comes on the air and he's like, so yeah, Maddie from Proji just called and requested this song. And, oh, cool. And then, so I said to, to Wistie today, I said, do you have any Elizabeth Cotton? And he's like, why do you say that? And, um, I said, because you got a good music collection. And I'm like, maybe. I hated that you busted it. <laughs> and I was like, maybe if you have it, you know, you could dub a cassette for me. And, and uh, he's like, well, that's kind of weird because I was listening to The K and I heard him come on and say, here's a song by Elizabeth Cotton that Maddie requested. Oh. And he actually went out and bought it. Oh, seriously? When he heard that. Oh, my God. And, uh,. Now he's not going to let you borrow it. Now he's not going to help me out. <laughs> and I will say something like, how badly do you want to do this with Yeah. <laughs> Why do you ask that? Oh, cool. You want this dubbed? Is it? Love it. Shake sugar. Mm. And he was he's familiar with, with Bakken's pre, solo work, pre pre uh, Bogin solo work. Have you heard any? No, but he he said it's awesome. Yeah, you'll you'll get a taste. What's it like? Well, it's uh, it's he he sort of jumps from genre to genre. Like yeah. his hip hop song is like. Uh, Went down to the studio, smoking all kinds of buds, getting fucked up. Then she sucked my cock, said I got it going on. It's gonna be one of those things. That's what I remember. Oh, yeah, the, in the city, in the city, the, in the city. The, the, the I mean, that's like a, a funny, yeah, that, yeah, a, that, a funny that, hip hop. That, that doesn't seem like the source of a lot of endorsements. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. The Bowie song is pretty funny though. It's cool. Yeah, he really, he sort of like, like he, you know, he's got a sheet of paper in his room where like the BPMs for every, like, like here's a. Good so part. it's so it's hip hop based. No, no, no. But he likes hip hop, so he's done some some of that stuff. Um, he's done with the BPM. I mean, like he'll it'll be like Street Fight Man, BPM, one twenty four. Uh, Rolling Stone BPM. You mean of classic songs? Classic songs. He has but, the BPMs, and he but references the them, and he thinks about how I'm going to write a song now, and I want it to. Yeah, but those old songs of Tempos change. Yeah, that's also true. Back when they were drummers. I think, I mean, I like, we're talking about our next record is going to be more of a dance-based record. And uh, and we'll probably do a couple of his funky, slithery All right. tunes. Wow. He's already in that deep, huh? You ever see, see that Neil Young, um, that Neil Young, uh, what's the, what's the Neil Young documentary, the, 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 the the Jarmish one. It's basically Jarmish's uh, like as a result of 
Dead Man, you know the Dead Man. Yeah, movie? yeah. When like, Neil Young uh, did the soundtrack, he, he did a documentary on like Neil Young. Uh -huh. And I, so you know Frankie San Pedro or whatever his name is, you know, the, the, he's he's always saying like, in in drummers is that it, it, it's always like, you come around here with your camera, think you can capture thirty years of insanity? <laughs> You're crazy. Gene you can't just show up with a camera and capture the insanity that's been going on here in our lives for 30 years. <laughs> and of course, he's he's the newest member of the band. Yeah. <laughs> if only I'd told my story better, I could have made the final cut. And action. How did the uh, job searching go today? It's looking good. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get any of that. <laughs> sounds like you guys are ripping on McDonald's. So, man, Dax is just, allergic yeah, to horses, so, I mean, you know, yeah, how are we going to eat? They must not eat at McDonald's. But I don't know if we're going to have any pins left after today, because all we had was this. All we had was this.
Probably just start at the beginning. When did you start playing piano? I started playing piano when I was six years old. And I came across a friend who had a little Casio keyboard <laughs> and he played guitar and he really liked playing Chuck Berry songs. And, and so we sat around with the little drum machine that was in the Casio keyboard and, and learned Chuck Berry songs. And <laughs> when did you get when did you get involved with uh, with Maddie playing music? So basically, like I. I call up Maddie, uh, or I'm emailing him, or I can't remember now, but it's like, basically I had, was kind of looking at things and looking at all my stuff, and I was like, well, I either just want to sell all my gear, or else I want to go and play in your band. So I have to thank him for saving me from probably like, you know, the last seven years of sitting around thinking, I'd really like to be doing music. What's one of your favorite things about the music of Fogin? Um well, I think Maddie's songwriter. I think Maddie's the best songwriter in town in Minneapolis. Like, he he writes uh, more diverse music or different styles. Um, they're good good melodies. The influences come from all all over the place. He can write a you know a ballad one day, and the next thing he's writing some kind of weird tune where he's singing falsetto over the top of it. And always the, his range has just been. It's been really intriguing and it's been really cool because not only is he fairly prolific as far as just continuing to write, 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 but uh, uh, but for the most part, I, I can't say I've really ever heard a demo of his that I've been like, I can't play this, like this is dumb. It's like they're always really good songs. They're cool, you know, and and uh, uh, that's the main reason I've stayed with it for the whole time is because I'm just like. I can't really think of anybody else I'd really want to be uh, trying this hard to make the music be heard because it's really pretty interesting music and and I mean when it gets down to it it's all just rock and roll and it's all just pop songs but but uh, it, the quirkiness of the, the songs are pretty much things that they, they come from the influences that I totally the kind of music I listen to and have listened to and grown up listening to and, um, he's good he's just a good songwriter what do you think of uh, Lopez? Well, I I consider him, you know, like I've considered everybody that's ever been in the band as a brother and sister. I mean, this band's always worked as a family, more or less, and uh, and that's why it's probably existed as long as it has because the egos have always kept pretty much in check, and and uh, and everybody's just kind of genuinely got along very well. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know Mike very well up until a couple of years ago, and uh, and when when we asked him to be a part of the band, he was the f he was the first name that came up of a dozen people that I was like, I don't know Mike well enough, but I've talked to him three, four times, and he's perfect for this band. You know, I knew he could play music, I knew he like he liked the band, 
I knew he had a good, you know, pretty decent look. He was just overall, he was just like a perfect person to be in the band, and and uh, and I'm I'm glad we asked him, and I'm glad he like chose to be a part of it. I, I, he, he's his brother, you know. I mean, it's awesome. You know? So, uh, your name is Michael Lopez. Yes, it is, sir. But uh, you're better not betterwise known as betterwise known. Otherwise known in the band, known as. Um, it's faux suede now? Faux suede. Okay, I wanted you to say it, but uh, I got you too, so. Yeah, faux che was growing tiresome. Yeah. And wasn't it like faux che, like the building downtown? It was Maddie's uh, clever uh, invention. I, d I just recently got the, the faux tucker thing. I think Maddie's dream has always been to have a female drummer who stands. Uh, <laughs> Is that the Duluth thing coming back to him? I don't know, kind of like low or... Um, maybe, but I think uh, he just always appreciated uh, someone who stands and pounds a floor, Tom and snare drum. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit more tribal or a little bit more uh, Mo Tucker, straightforward, 2-4-4 four, four on the floor rock and roll. What were you doing musically before Fogin? Um. Well, I, I started playing drums when I was a wee lad of 12 years old and um, discovered guitar when I was like 20. I started playing guitar, moved down here when I was 21 to Minneapolis in 98. Steve was living down here and uh, started playing in a band with him. Uh, I met um, Ben Bachman, Mark Landry, Kat Hickson back in like 2000. started playing the 100 Flowers, playing drums in 100 Flowers and uh, moved on from that band, played lead guitar in the Idle Hands, and then we opened up for Fogin a few times, and uh, was asked to play bass in Fogin after I had left the Idle Hands back in 2004. Uh, and was it Maddie who contacted you, or is it uh, Dax, or, no. or did you contact the band? Or? No, Maddie gave me a call. We had uh, been friends. I'd actually heard a demo of Maddie's. Um, when he was in Whipperwill, they recorded this tape, and that was back in like the early 90s. And my friend Jeff Henneman, who filmed a mm -hmm. uh, little, like a short documentary on Fogine back in like 2002 or something like that, played Whipperwill for me. Um, along with a lot of other local bands that I wasn't familiar with back in like 99 or something like that. And I didn't pay much attention. And uh, I saw Maddie at a party after seeing Fogin a few times and being impressed with the live show and deciding that they were my favorite band at the time to get drunk to and dance around in the audience with. Um, I saw him at a party and introduced myself and he, he was a really nice guy right off the bat. And, he got me a job at Camp Yellow when I needed a job, and uh, we just hung out at parties. And then uh, after uh, Cody and Nicole quit, Fogin, and uh, I had played Milasha with Idle Hands, I got a call from Maddie asking if I'd play bass, and I wasn't really sure because uh, I was working on another project, which I'm still playing in right now with Ben Bachman from The Hunter Flowers. And, um, on top of that, I was not really sure. I wanted to play bass. I can play bass. I like playing bass. But I'm not a bass player. And I I was also very enamored with the Hunter Flowers, so I was, or with uh, Fogin, anyway. And so I was uh, a little intimidated, you know? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I, I loved seeing Fogin from the audience. And so. He told me to think about it, he gave me a call back like a month later. He told me to come over and hang out and meet everybody. And I showed up and uh, Maddie, Dax, uh, Grinder, and Al were there and Corinne was there and they were like sitting around recording four track stuff. And uh, we proceeded to, uh, Grinder and I proceeded to lay down uh, foot stomps and hand claps for uh, a song. and. Uh, I think he kind of planned it out so that we would all kind of 
break the ice and just have a good time. Cool. They were such nice guys, and they were so uh, they were so open to to you know playing. Um, I, I didn't know if I would be able to like fulfill their obligation of touring or recording or anything like that, but they said just come and rehearse and have a good time, and I did. And it's been a year and a half now, something like that. Cool. What uh, personally do you think about Maddie? What do I think about Maddie? Yeah. That's a juicy question, isn't it? <laughs> I think Maddie is a great guy. He's always been a great guy ever since I met him. Um, he's a very talented songwriter, creative. He's uh, one of my favorite songwriters, probably. Uh, as a person, he's very generous. He's very deliberate in his in his uh, his speech. So I mean, when he's not talking about music or ideas about Fojin, he's talking about ideas and music about Fojin. It's almost like a fucking riddle or puzzle you have to figure out because he'll like go from one idea to another and you have to fill in the blanks um, but he's always he's very open to ideas even if he's very passionate and adamant about his idea he'll listen to somebody else's idea and he'll give the impression that he's definitely taken into consideration but I think deep down he has plotted his course mm -hmm. uh, in his vision and he, he will realize it um, with or without you, uh, but um, I, you know, I admire his vision. He's he's uh, he's a very unique voice, um, artistically and and literally. And um, I mean, I guess that's one of the reasons why I think Fojin is uncategorizable, and his music's uncategorizable. And, as a person, he's kind of uncategorizable. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. If you had only um, a couple minutes, or maybe even a, like a single minute, to tell like a record producer or something, like as he got onto a plane, you know, like what Fojin is all about, like how would you briefly describe if you had to, if you, how would you describe Fojin? Um, I would say Fojin has a unique sound to offer the uh, the world of music in a pop sense and in the musical sense. Um, it's very, uh, there's a very diverse um, group of, of songs in the last three records. I, I like Fojin because there are ballads, there are dance rock songs, there are many influences from d different places. Don't believe a word he says! <laughs> I think my cover has just been blown. Oh no. It's a liar! <laughs> it's a liar! Now, juxtaposed to that person, I, see, I seem like I'm coming across very serious. And yeah. I should like pull down my pants or something. <laughs> Moon the camera. And um, what do you think of, um, what do you think of Steve? Well, I just got to know Steve just recently when he kind of moved down here. I actually met him in the winter time. We went up to Grand Forks. Actually, I'd heard his music from Michael, and uh, and it was the first thing I'd heard that was just a kind of an underground tape that I was like, I was just like, oh, this is really pretty cool. Like Steve's music, and because he wrote in all these different styles, kind of like Maddie. And uh, we'd be at a party, or we'd be having a party, and the, the litmus test was just like putting on Steve's music and seeing if people got it or not, you know? Because <laughs> it's like, if they did, then we knew that it was like, it was a good time. And if the people were just bumming out, we were like, well, you guys should go to the next room or whatever, because we're just vibing on Steve's music right now. So when I met him a couple, um, in the winter time or whatever, I was, we played a show with him, and that's the first time I saw him play live. And he could play, he was playing keyboards, and he had a guitar strapped around his neck, and he was singing and stuff, and, and uh, I was just like, wow, this is like, he, he's got really long fingers, and so as a piano player, it's like, it's fun to watch somebody that can like, you know, play like, you know, just has longer fingers than I do, and be able to play like that, and, and I was just like, oh man, Steve's actually a really good musician too, you know, and uh, and then later that night I talked to him for the first time, and, and I was just like, you know, he's, he's, he's a character, you know, but uh, a good soul at heart too, and another person that's perfect to be in the band. Oh. 
All right, Steve. Um, how'd you get roped into playing this playing in this band? Uh, well, I was living up north. This girl kicked me out, right? So I'm like, <laughs> I better get out of town. My best friend in the entire history of the world, Fuss Wade, says, hey, you can stay with us. So, pack up all my stuff, get in my car, drive about halfway here, car breaks down, got it fixed. I come here, I'm thinking I'll just hang out for a while, get a job, maybe play some music, you know. Wrong, wrong. Two days after I'm here, Maddie comes out in this like Flash Gordon costume. See, what did uh, what were you doing musically before you came to Fojin? Well, I was playing like uh, first way and I, when I used to live here, we played in a band, a couple of bands together. Uh, you know, I, I, I had a little unit up north, which you know we'd play every month or two or something like that. But there wasn't really. Uh, a lot of opportunities. It wasn't a scene, you know. I have, I've been writing songs and, and recording, um, mostly four track stuff like that, you know, like nothing too fancy. But uh, I mean, I started playing guitar when I was ten. Started writing songs when I was twelve. And so was it going to be? Uh, the Musically, question, before that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I was writing some of my songs. I had a little band, you know. We play some stuff, and I, I would sing and play guitar, and. Um, you know, I'd, I'd always... You were a friend of Mike's. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd known him for about 11 years. And we played in a, a couple of bands long ago. Um, but I always wanted to just play guitar, you know. Like, I always wanted to write songs, too. And that's still something that I'd like to do. And, and Mike has his own, you know, project for that as well. But, um being able to, you know, just play guitar, which is, you know, a lot of fun with a great, you know, songwriter like, like, like Maddie is, is the best. <laughs> I don't cool. Know. Yeah, so you had, uh, you had recorded some of your own music. Um, you know, I still am, I'm writing songs and I'm, you know, trying to uh, get something going with that eventually, but first I have to get a job, so. Uh, yeah. Priorities, priorities, priorities. <laughs> um, let's see. There go my questions. Uh, what is your favorite thing about playing with this ensemble? Um, probably the songs are just, you know, great. I mean, they're, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to play, uh, yeah, I played in cover bands, you know, I played like Leonard Skinner where I'm just like glitching my teeth and this is horrible, you know, it's like even if there's an audience there and they're into it, it's still horrible, but to be actually playing songs that you like, it's really a good feeling, and, um, but everybody is really great personalities, I mean, they all know what they're doing, they're really easy to work with, and, mm. you know, you don't have to worry about any kind of drama or anything. Yeah. Besides the normal drama, no. unnecessary drama right. you're free Just of. Enough. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to keep it interesting. And um, like, uh, what, what do you think uh, about Maddie? I have the turtleneck on. Cool. Uh, what do you think about Dax? Well, Dax is another story, no? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a story here. Okay. We're still rolling? Yeah, yeah. These, these, there's some train tracks back over here, right? One time Mike and I were hanging out, like, 2 o'clock in the morning. We're sitting on the railroad tracks playing guitar, you know? And um, there's two sets of tracks. So we're sitting there. And I see some train coming from from um, Mike's in on my left side. I see a train coming this way. I'm like, hey man, I think there's a train coming. We better we better go. He's like, oh, he looks back. It's like it's on the other side. We'll be fine. I'm like, uh, okay, whatever. So we're sitting on this one set of tracks. The train is going behind us, and um, then Mike looks over to the other direction. He's like, okay, now we gotta go because there was another train coming right towards us. 
And so basically, he saved my life. Not the first time. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, well, that was going to be the next question. Um, <laughs> has Mike ever saved your life? Yeah. <laughs> no, yes, he has. <laughs> no, um, what, what about Mike? What can you say about Mike? Mike, I've known forever. And then there's Maddie and Corinne and Dax, who are all, you know, I've met them around the same time. I think the first time I met them, I, I was playing a band I opened for them um, in Fargo. And, um, you know, that was the first time I had really met all of them. And, um, I mean, they've been nothing but nice, and more than nice, actually. <laughs> Let's see, and uh, as for Scott, um, what's Scott? Scott is an awesome drummer. I've known, I've been acquainted with him for, for a long time, a band he used to play in called Flim Flam Man, way back in the day, like 90, uh, 98, 97, 98. And um, they were kind of like the fall, kind of glam, whatever, you know. Uh, that's when I first saw Frenchie Scott, you know, play drums. And I, I mean, they were all really virtuosic, but also uh, creative, you know, people. And so it's great to be working with him. He's, he's become a very professional musician, you know, but he. Um, he brings a lot of feeling to. I mean, it's, you know, you have a solid foundation behind you, and um, nice guy. I'll say is uh, Charlie Murphy. Darkness is spreading. <laughs> what did the five fingers say to the face? What? Slap! <laughs> Thank you, Steve. What about Corinne? What do you have to say about Corinne? Uh, well, I think Corinne is a, probably, is one of the, the most talented people I've been in a rock band with, you know, she's, uh, uh, got a great voice, she's, uh, uh, she's, she was born to be a performer pretty much, you know, and she reminds me of, of, I wish, you know, I'm kind of a little bit older than she is, and, and I wish I kind of had the energy sometimes that she has because I see her want all these things, and uh, and it's like it makes me want to like work harder to help her achieve the things that she wants because I think like she's such a good singer and really deserves to have the chance to have her voice be heard. She's a performer, and she should be she should have success because she's very good at what she does. Like, how is that? How was it? Yeah. It was good. Uh, it's kind of my weird little subculture. Yeah, I don't know. It's like I work here at Cafe Barbet, and oh. so it's like all of my friends from all over the city being in one place at one time. Yeah. So right. I felt like I needed to put out a little bit for the people. That was awesome. It was fun. It was a good time. It was kind of like a home I like playing outdoors, too. Home field. Oh, my God, like the, the lighting is terrific. I mean, totally. you can get everybody constantly. Yep, and breeze is nice, too, even though it's definitely hot. We guys looked awesome up there, so. Get an autograph. I got you. Know, I will. Oh yeah. Fuck yeah, why not? Sign an autograph. It'll be good video. Can I sign him on your boobs instead? <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Ow. Oh. Wait, wait. <laughs> During the whole uh, lineup change, uh, when when you guys lost members, uh, when Fujin sort of you know went uh, into hi hibernation for a while, um, what was that whole period like? I mean, did you think that it was going to that you guys were going to recruit more people? Or? Well, you know, when it all the reason that the original lineup broke up was you know for various different reasons. We we done a lot of what we ever set out to do and achieved a lot as far as what I thought was possible. Um, some of the people felt like it wasn't going to go any further than that, and so it was time to like do something else, you know, which I totally respect and I think is totally cool. So, but when, you know, once you get to that level, it's hard to just say, oh, I think I'm going to put that in a box and put that away now. So, uh, when we started looking for people again, it was really like, it was like, where do you start? You know, I mean, I told, I, I was like, Maddie, like, let's start up a new band. Let's, it's, it's too hard to, like, just kind of keep the whole thing together as a story. 
by basically, you know, uh, getting all these new people. But the big thing was finding a, a gal singer that could sing well. And I knew Maddie, like, had seen Corinne sing, and he was like, this is the girl, you know. And, uh, and when I heard her sing, I was like, yeah, this will actually work out. At the same time, Michael, like, uh, joined on, and that was, like, from there we had a band. I mean, we could start performing again because we had a drummer, our mm-hmm. grinder, our old drummer, like, was playing. Um, Al Wires, Gene Wire, he was still playing at the time. Um, eventually Gene Wire left, and we were just down to a five-piece, and basically where we're at now is pretty much, it was that five, those five people that were, like, making the music, and then eventually added Steve here. Um, I, I, I didn't I didn't ever think it wasn't going to, like, wasn't going to get put back together. It always seemed like it just, it, it had, had the ability to. Um, the hardest thing is that rebuilding a band is probably more difficult than actually building a band. You know, it's, it's, you're, you're, uh, it, it's an interesting experiment. You know, it's like, wouldn't it, you, you have this thing that people are used to hearing and all these songs that you're used to hearing by the musicians that are performing them and then all of a sudden you're asking them to be receptive to all these other new voices. I mean, I think of like Kiss or something like that. It's like, you know, you, you can't replace Ace Freely, you know? <laughs> and when you do, um, you, the band's bound to change. Um, now, different levels of bands have different levels of success at it. And it's, it's some have more luck at it than others, but, but, uh, um, but I think that the, the big thing is to kind of just hold true to to the music a little bit as silly as that sounds and I mean really it is just people playing music and uh, as long as you kind of move forward on everything eventually hopefully people will be receptive to what you're doing with new people and and I think that was uh, that's always been our what we've hoped people would we hope people would be open to listening to all this stuff with other people you know and I think they have been for the most part.
So, where are we? This is what, 4th and 11th, downtown Minneapolis. I'm gonna go look, look at uh, First Avenue nightclub where we've had some of our uh, most fun playing. I imagine Green Lot. I've seen so many great shows at First Avenue. Yeah. I think the loudest show I ever saw was The Jesus Lizard. Really? And you can ask any of my bandmates, they all think I'm deaf, but you have to realize I got <laughs> Lopez and Bakken, who are both like the quietest talkers in the world. That's true. So like my new deafness compounded with uh, uh, two mumblers, it's just a bad rest. Well, the first club show I, I saw was Husker Du. Here in Minneapolis? No, it was in Duluth. Oh, it was in Duluth. Oh, duh, duh. I'm pretty, I can't, I think it was like Iron, maybe it was Otto's Chemical Lounge and the Magnolias. Where, it's like all these Minneapolis, a couple of guys started bringing bands up, Minneapolis bands up to Duluth and they were yeah. playing at the Orpheum Cafe. It's kind of strange, Ed Ackerson, who, you know, Sustones, yeah. who put out our last two records. Turns out he was at that Husker Du show. That in same Duluth, one. Yeah, in Duluth. And I was in ninth grade, you know, <laughs> slam dancing and all that jazz. Funny where yeah. paths cross. The, I think the first 45 I ever bought was, um, was it? She Loves You by the Beatles. Okay. And then on the Swan label. And then and the first long play record I bought was Cheap Trick Live at Budokan. Marcel on the radio. Have you listened to this? Heavy Marcel? Sleeper? Oh, Heavy Sleeper. I've heard a little bit of Heavy Sleeper. Some of you know, like... When you Marcel Gang, who was in The Hang-Ups. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, he was at the Sloan show. He, okay. he guitar tech for us so he could get in. Oh, okay. Which um, is nice. Which one was he? Um, oh, he's he's uh, of Filipino descent. And he was he was working guitars. For you. Yeah, he was like tuning guitar. Was he sitting on the couch? Uh, with yeah. You guys. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's a good dude. But this is. He's. Uh... Yeah, there's some really good songs on this record.
spectrum of today's music? Uh, well, I don't know. I suppose it depends on what you think of today's music as. You know, I, um, I'd say we're, we're weird, you know, we're different, we're, we are uh, quirkier, you know, and, you know, like, I write these songs, whatever, you know, we don't really belong to a genre necessarily. We're sort of trying. I guess I, I think of us as sort of trying to operate in a post-genre uh, environment. You know, where uh, you you're like you know, say you write a song that has a country influence. Should you say no? We're alternative rock. You know. We can't do that. I don't really believe in that. It's just sort of whatever comes out, comes out. And if it's good enough, you record it. And, uh, or you try to, you know. And uh, try to get the money together and get the people together and go into the studio and do it. Um, I, I, I guess I, I sort of just like the name Foji in itself is kind of like willfully obscure. And our music sort of in a way is willfully obscure. But I think what we have in common with what's on popular radio is that a lot of what we do is, or a lot of what I do is write songs that people can dance to or should be able to dance to. And, um, and, and but while also trying to bring more meaning, uh, not always, you know, but like uh, a song like Chartreuse Skirt is a, da a song that you're supposed to dance to. I, s I do, I guess, sort of put a lot of time into words and into that aspect of writing. And mm -hmm. Sort of a band that writes their own music and plays their own songs and um, sort of separates you from a lot of what's on popular radio. But I'm, I'm trying to think like bands that I feel kinship with that I hear on, on the radio would be like Dressy Bessie is like a band that I think is sort of writing 
music that's fun mm -hmm. um, and, and based on personal experience or uh, what's that mountain goats oh yeah you know I mean the difference between mountain goats and Fojinas I didn't release my uh, songs on cassette you know <laughs> over the years I sort of kept them in a shoebox in my room mm -hmm. and I've tried to put out albums that way mm -hmm. but um because I'm sure could Cassette release, cassette only releases will follow at some point. Everyone, please welcome Fojin. Thank you.
The song is called The Ballad of Kim and Thurston. <laughs> 
long as we're alive Why don't we write some songs? We can start a band So we can play our songs And we will buy a van And drive to other towns So we can play our songs For the people who are there And maybe if they like us They will buy a record If they buy enough Then we'll be our jobs And yeah, yeah, yeah And this is the way critics are listening to or what you know this that or the other is I mean we're, we're a quintessential Minneapolis band you know where where we might never get out of this town because of, um, of our uni uniqueness I guess but I don't think we'll ever be dissatisfied if uh, if if we don't get out because we know we're sitting here making uh, music that is pretty decent and pretty representative of the lives that we're sitting here living at the moment um, uh, I think looking back in history, people will be like, "Oh yeah, Foji, they're quintessential Minneapolis band." They, they, you know, people in Minneapolis liked them because because they were so Minneapolis, you know. And I think if you look across, you know, all kinds of, of uh, you know, twelve rod, soul asylum, uh, uh, 
the suburbs, the wallets. There's, I mean, there's so much musical history here of bands just being like, oh, they're really like, uh, they're really unique to themselves. And then when the music starts to get out into the, uh, uh, gets out into the, the national public eye or international public eye, it gets a little more difficult because they're not quite sure what to think about it. But I, I, I guess I'd like to think that there's a, a faux gene song for pretty much everyone out there. And, and uh, um, as long as the band can stick around long enough and make records, eventually they'll get it, you know? And if not, it's not a big deal, you know?
Dax about the uh, title for the video yet? His, oh, History and the Faking, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, I didn't know if... Crappy there's... album title, great. <laughs> it makes a little more sense on visuals. Yeah. Is anybody going to be offended if I spell the word S-H-I-T in a song? No objections? Okay. Around the time of the publication of the Gutenberg Bible, 1400s. There was another book came out called uh, Till Eulenspiegel and his Mary Tanks. And old Till sold uh, S H I T. The reason I wrote this song is because we expurgated the word S H I T from one of our songs in hopes that it would be on the radio. Here's a song for all the kids They all know it rhymes with it And it starts with shh No, you cannot say it on TV Ooh, S-H-I-T is poop S-H-I-T is crap S-H-I-T spells poopy pants What's wrong with that? Play this on the radio? <laughs> there's, there's a notion among the leaders of our country that dumb when spelled a certain way is wrong. You cannot say that on TV or the radio. S H I T is poop. S H I T. What's that? S H I T is poop. pants. What's wrong with that? S and H with an I and a T is poopy pants. What's wrong with that? Thank you. I played that for uh, my bandmates, and, and they said it was very self-indulgent. <laughs>